I've been asked to uh, define Gordon Gribb. Ever heard of him? Well, it could be me, and it could be that I'm not Gordon Gribb, because when I tried to join the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, uh, in World War II, actually after Pearl Harbor, I went down to the Alameda County Courthouse. I couldn't find my birth certificate. Well, all my life, that is, I was about 20 years of age, I had been Gordon Greb. But they couldn't find it. I'd been born in a little farmhouse, a little, almost a log cabin built by my grandfather in Irvington, California. So I knew when I was born because my mother and father told me. I knew the whole story. But the official records said Gordon Greb did not exist. And people began to go looking through all the records until finally they found a, one that said goal. Well, there was a baby goal born on August the 7th when you claimed that you were born in Irvington, California. I said, well, it had to be me because this little town only had about 500 residents. They didn't have babies every day on this particular date. But Gordon Goal? I think we should check this thing out with my parents. I want to find out, was I adopted? Or what? So I went home. My mother said, oh, sure, you are who you are. Well, I'm glad to know about that. My father said, yes, you are who we claim you to be. Well, then what am I going to do? I cannot join the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and help win the war against Adolf Hitler and the Japanese who just bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, you're not an alien, so we'll get a lawyer. So we got a lawyer so that I could join the Army and carry a gun or fly an airplane or sail in a ship. We got a lawyer so I could enter World War II. Well, the lawyer said, well, all you got to do is fill out a, a document here. We'll get it notarized, and I'm a lawyer. I'll assert that the parents of you, who claims to be Gordon Greb, is actually Gordon Greb. So my parents had this legal document drawn up. I signed it. We got it notarized, and I went back down to Alameda County Courthouse and filed it. I said, okay, you're now who you claim to be. Whew. How lucky can you be? So eventually I joined what? I tried to volunteer for the Air Force. No, you wear glasses. You can't fly an airplane with the glasses. So I had to learn of the Marine Corps hymn. Oh, I wanted to go to Quantico and become an officer leading the charge uh, against the enemy. No, because we have so many applicants after Pearl Harbor, we can't take anybody with glasses. Same thing happened with every branch of the service except, guess what, good old U.S. Army. They didn't even look at my feet. They could have been flat. They didn't care. So long as I was warm, the Army took me. That is, almost took me. But they did give me an eye examination. This eye examination one more time. And since I knew the eye examination kept me out of all these other branches, I was lucky. As I sat in the waiting room, I could see the eye chart with my glasses on. So I thought, I memorized it. Of course, there's the big E, and then the smaller, smaller type down to the smallest. I memorized all of them, every line. Then I took off my glasses, and I went in to see the oculist, or optometrist. And he said, well, son, you're here for a checkup on your eyes. I said, yes, sir, I'm joining the military. All right, well, read the chart up there. So I read it. And I, I said, well, there's a big E, and of course, it's, well, read the, the best line you can read. I said, well, I can read them all right down to the bottom, which is da 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 He took a look at me. He said, son, that's very good, but where did you put your glasses? I said, what do you mean, doctor? He said, the indentation on your eyes tells me that you wore glasses. But he said, you're going into the Army, so no problem. You're accepted. He stamps the thing, and I'm in the Army. Why is this story so important? Because it's typical of my life. It's been hard. How did I get through it? Well, I wrote a book about that, and uh, it's now available uh, as an e-book. If you want to spend six bucks, go to my publisher, iUniverse.com, and look it up. It's called Google Brain. Why Google Brain? Well, that's another story. It so happens that in my work of doing this, that, and the other thing, 
I ended up in San Jose, California, which became the birthplace, one of the major birthplaces of the computer revolution. And I was there when all these guys in Los Gatos and Sunnyvale and San Jose and Santa Clara and Palo Alto were trying to put together something that we now call a, a PC, a personal computer. So uh, I was there even when, when Google people from Stanford began to play around and created this great search engine. Uh, well, I finally figured out that if you examine your brain and your memory, it's kind of like Google. You ask yourself a question. Um, what was the movie that Cary Grant made where he pushed uh, um, somebody down the stairs, or no, out the door? Was that the Philadelphia story? Yeah, how did I get that? Because that was rose up. I had several other possibilities in movies, but my Google brain said Philadelphia story. So if your brain works kind of like Google, why not call my book Google Brain? Because in trying to write it, I had to remember what, what was the first memory I ever had. Well, my first memory actually was of classical music. Nowadays, they say if you play classical music for your little baby, it'll, well, it may enlarge their brain and make their brain sharper and able to absorb more of the great things of life. You know all about Aristotle and Plato and, and uh, the history of, uh, of, uh, of India and China, etc. So my parents, who were lovers of music, my father played the piano, and my father played the, viol the violin, and uh, my, my mother had learned the piano. So they were going to introduce me to the finer music of life. Well, all that did is make me a disc jockey eventually when the radio came along. Because I love music, I thought, well, why not have people pay me to play it? So for a long while, a number of years, I had the fun of going into a radio station and selecting all the music that I liked and do various programs. In fact, one of the first jobs I got after I got out of the Army, I was in the Army in the war for, th for three years, and... Uh, I got my first job at KTIM in San Rafael, in which we put this station on the air, and uh, we had the kind of different programs that you see on television, except in radio, you can't see it except in your imagination. So the schedule called for me to be there at, at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning to do a 45-minute program of Western music. And at, and at, uh, at uh, 6.45, we played a transcription. This was a huge 16-inch disc that had a religious program on it where a minister would give talks about uh, the Bible. And then at, at, nine, at, eight, at 7 o'clock, we had Good Morning Marin, which was two hours of wake-up music, popular music, and commercials, till 9 o'clock when we had 15 minutes of 9 o'clock news and so forth. Well, when I started doing this program, uh, I played music uh, Western music, and then I played the, the religious thing, and I decided it was too dull. People weren't going to listen, so I changed my voice. For the Western show, I became uh, the old timer with Happy Gordon, and with the different voice changes and so forth, I made it a unique program. And then, uh, after the minister had done his 15 minute transcription, I came on with Good Morning Marin, and I had Daisy May, a little kid who would come in and start playing with the control board and records were running at the wrong speed. Oh, Daisy May. Well, I'd get Daisy May out of there. So I did that for two hours. Now, I mention this because the owner of the station was a very proud man, and his brother flew in to see him here in California. The owner had been raised back in Georgia someplace. And so that morning, early in the morning, the manager picked him up at the airport and took him to San Rafael to listen to his new station. He tuned it in or he tried to tune it in, and he kept tuning it around to 1510, and he couldn't find it because there was this old timer on the air they'd never heard of before, and by the time they got to San Rafael, there was this happy Gordon guy. So finally he figured out it was me. So I got called into the office. What do you think you're doing? And so I explained to him I was trying to make it a variety program. He said, well, Gordon, keep it up. That was very interesting, keep it up. So you see, I took a risk and it worked out. Well, I don't know what else to say about my life other than it's been up and down like that from the very beginning. 
and somehow or other I ended up into teaching because I figured out that if you like disc jockey work, there's no room in radio or television for a ball-headed, wrinkled old prune, which is what I eventually became and what you're looking at right now on your screen. So I decided I better get out of this business, which requires starlight qualities, and go to teaching. Because the kids can't complain about what you look like. They have to take whatever funny-looking guy walks into the classroom. So that's why I became a teacher, plus the fact I like young people. I'm really still kind of young in a way. I'd like to conclude this by mentioning that my granddaughter, when I gave her a book of poems to read, I said, pick out a good poem that represents Grandpa on his 90th birthday. It's called, How Old Are You? Age is a quality of mind. If you've left your dreams behind, if hope is cold, if you no longer look ahead, if your ambitions and your fires are dead, then you are old. But if from your life you take the best, and if in life you keep the jest, if you love, you hold, no matter how the years go by, no matter how the birthdays fly, you're not old. I guess I'm not old, even at 90.